Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to this Field Fisher webinar. My name is Felicity Fisher, although you'll hear many of my colleagues refer to me as Flick. Um, I'm a partner out here in our Silicon Valley office, um, and I'm joined today by my fantastic co-host and colleague, Richard Lorne. Um, so Hi, everyone. <laughs> In ordinary times, we would both be beaming this out from our office in Palo Alto, but um, we are both working remotely. So I'm in San Francisco today and Richard is in LA. Um, so we've been really excited to pull together this webinar. And in fact, um, this is the first of a series of webinars that we're going to be running on the topic of AI and data protection. Um, really, the goal was to try and sort of break down some of the data protection principles that we know are enshrined in the GDPR and actually have a sort of focused discussion on how we should be thinking about the application of those GDPR principles in the context of using AI technology. And we're really kind of interested in giving this information both from the perspective of vendors who may be using AI to provide the services that they provide or to develop and improve their products and features, or if you're a consumer of AI technology. All of the or a number of the issues that we're going to be talking about over this series will be relevant to both sides of the table there. Um, one of the reasons why AI is an interesting topic for us data protection lawyers is that it relies on vast amounts of data, both to train the algorithms that power the models um, and to produce the predictions or decisions that make AI such a powerful tool. And whilst the GDPR doesn't specifically regulate AI, because we know it's a principle-based piece of regulation that's technology agnostic, it does regulate the processing of personal data. Um, and so it becomes really important to think about the principles enshrined in the GDPR whenever we're using personal data uh, to power uh, the processing activities that support AI technology and its development. And the focus of today's webinar is really going to be thinking about how we determine what role you may be playing uh, when you're using AI technology or providing AI as a service, and more specifically, whether you're acting as a controller or processor. Now, there are various different phases of processing and different stages of processing that will be relevant to the development and use of AI technology. And so often people will be wearing various different hats and it can be quite, become quite tricky to figure out exactly what role you're playing. But actually making that determination is really crucial because we know that the, the compliance responsibilities that you have under the GDPR will very much be determined by whether or not you're acting as a controller or processor. So making that upfront determination is really crucial to them being able to understand and map what other compliance obligations you might have to comply with. And some of those other compliance obligations are something we're going to explore in the future webinar series. So we're going to have a number of interesting topics that we're going to look at, you know, going beyond just the essentials, which we're going to talk about today. Um, and then we're going to look at ethics and explainability and how you can develop a compliance strategy. But today, to kickstart things off, we're really going to think about whether or not you're acting as a controller or processor. And sorry, my Amazon delivery has arrived in the background. So um, I'm now going to hand things over to Richard, who's going to kickstart by kind of demystifying what AI is and talk through some key principles before we delve into the controller processor analysis. Great, thanks Flick. So before we dive into our GDPR discussion today, um, and as Flick says, we just set up a little bit of context. So the first question is obviously, what is artificial intelligence? And that's, you know, a very broad term. It's used to describe a range of different technologies, including things like machine learning, neural networks, deep learning, and the like. Um, and there are a lot of definitions for that. But what we're interested in is what does AI mean in the context of data protection? And this is a fairly dry definition that was provided by the International Working Group on Data Protection in Telecommunications, which is that AI is the theory and development of computer systems able to perform tasks normally requiring human intelligence. Okay, so that's pretty broad and it captures a really wide range of use cases. And on the slide on the left hand side, we've listed some of the most prominent examples of where AI is being deployed today. So looking at that list, we have content filtering. 
you might be using AI to filter spam or perhaps to review and moderate content on a platform. Image detection and classification, that's a huge area at the moment. So using AI to recognize uh, objects and people in images and videos. And we've got a number of different purposes here. So image labeling, facial recognition, tracking object movements, or even sophisticated things like inferring certain characteristics like an, a person's emotional state. And, and a good example of, of this use case is um, using AI in autonomous vehicles. The third one on our list is natural language processing, another big area. So using AI to recognize speech and maybe to transcribe or translate that speech or using AI as part of a virtual voice assistant to understand speech commands. And similarly, another huge field is processing text to optimize writing, like to improve somebody's grammar. And then there are Two other areas uh, we can think about, recommendation algorithms. Now, these have been around for some time. That's using AI to analyze patterns of behavior and previous interactions or transactions to recommend products or features for a user and for advertising and marketing purposes. And the last one we, we, we've described here is classifying risk. So using AI to generate a credit risk report or perhaps to predict fraud at the user or individual transaction level. And you know, depending on the use case, there are gonna be different considerations in terms of data protection and your obligations under the GDPR. So for example, these last two examples, uh, recommendation algorithms and classifying risk. These really involve, you know, uh, more direct examples of profiling individuals and making predictions and decisions about those individuals, which obviously have a clear direct impact on people. The other important thing to consider, which Flick previously mentioned, is the data itself. So you might be obtaining and using data from a variety of different sources as part of your AI deployment. And this also will have uh, an impact on your obligations under data protection law. So, for example, you might be obtaining data directly yourself, for example, by capturing photographs or videos from the real world and using that directly sourced data to train models. Similarly, you might be obtaining data from publicly available sources and using that to train your models, or maybe you're buying in or licensing data from third party sources. But um, the, the other very important source of data is from your own platform or application. So your private data set, which is really valuable to better understand how users are engaging with your platform and what decisions and actions they're taking. So this data set might be part of a walled garden if you're you know, keeping and retaining that data, the Googles and the Facebooks of this world, or perhaps you're sharing that data with an AI vendor who might also use the data to, to uh, improve and train their own global models, which is something we'll come on to later. And then lastly on the slide, we also have usage and metadata. So similarly, data about how people are interacting with a platform, the telemetry data that's being sent back, that can be equally useful in terms of uh, marketing and sales as well. So to suffice to say, there are increasingly a um, number of different examples of where AI is being used in our daily life, and it's increasingly important. And regulators are very much aware of this. So for a number of regulators in Europe, they've identified AI as an important focus area. And some have also issued specific guidance on the responsible use of AI in the context of data protection. So, for example, the UK ICO, they've issued um, some very detailed guidance and developed an, a framework for auditing AI compliance. And they've also identified AI as one of its top three strategy priorities. At the EU level, we still don't have any specific AI guidance from the EDPB. But there are some AI related examples in its other guidelines, such as guidelines on data protection by design and default. And also 
um, the EDPB has published a long list of guidance that it intends to put out as part of its work program for 2021 and 2022, and AI features on that very long list as well. So we should be expecting guidance at the E level. Another important thing to mention here is that we have our uh, focus from the data protection regulators, but the European Commission has also developed a strategy for AI and is intending to introduce a new legislative proposal for AI this year. And that won't be specific to data protection, but it's part of a broader legal and ethical framework for AI in Europe and applying to both developers and users of AI. So that is something to watch out for as well. With that said, let's now turn in to our discussion on the GDPR and as Flick says today we're going to be focusing on that key question, what is your data processing role when you are using AI? This is really fundamental because obviously it informs all of your obligations under the GDPR and it flows into everything else that we going to be discussing during our webinar series. So when you're deploying or using and benefiting from AI, are you acting as a data controller or a data processor when you're doing that? And these are the GDPR terms, but there are equivalent concepts under other data protection laws too. So Brazil LGBT, that also talks about controllers and processors, and the California CCPA talks about businesses and service providers. So we're going to assume you're familiar with these concepts, but the key question is always going to be, are you determining the purposes and means of processing when you're using AI, or are you simply processing on behalf of another? And as Flick mentioned, you've got to think about the specific context. So you could be wearing different hats depending on the context, and you could be a controller or a processor of the same data. And here's a brief reminder of why controllership matters and why this question is so important. This is a list of the responsibilities for controllers and the responsibilities for processors. And suffice it to say, the list on the left, the controller responsibilities, it's longer, it's far more comprehensive. So you are directly responsible for a greater number of obligations under the GDPR. But for AI, the, the key ones to pick out are the fact that you are going to be responsible for honoring data subject rights. That includes providing transparency to data subjects and explaining AI to them, but also complying with key principles like privacy by design and default, and also completing DPIAs if your use of AI may have a high risk for individuals concerned. So there's, that's clearly going to inform your compliance strategy and it's your liability exposure as well. And apart from these, you know, very plain key responsibilities under the law, there's also a broader commercial question and strategic considerations to think about if you're positioning as a controller or a processor. And I'm going to turn over to Flick now, who's just going to run with that thought. Cool. Thanks, Richard. Yeah, so as Richard has hinted at, um, clearly there is the issue of, you know, if you assume a controller role, then you're also assuming a significantly longer list of compliance responsibilities that you have to comply with. Whereas if you are, you know, a processor of the particular data set, then really you are assuming a much more limited role from a compliance perspective because you are only ever allowed to process the personal data on the instructions of the controller. And that has a number of trickle down um, impacts. It means, for example, that you can't retain data or you're not supposed to retain data beyond the life of the agreement. You're supposed to be deleting or returning it at the request of the controller. And I flag that deletion point because often that's the trigger for kind of making people question, hang on a second, when we're using data for, you know, to develop our products or to train our models, are we actually acting as a processor? Because actually we want to be able to retain the data, data that we've collected in the context of, for example, providing our technology to a customer. We want to retain it and use it and replay it to keep training our models because it's really, really useful data. 
And at that point, it usually triggers a big kind of question, hang on a second, if we want to retain it, we may be acting as the controller when we want to use it for other purposes beyond just providing the particular um, feature or service to our customer. And so it becomes, Another reason why it becomes a really important strategic upfront consideration. Have you incorrectly, if you're a vendor who wants to use data to train your models to improve your AI technology, have you actually incorrectly just uh, you know, positioned yourself as a pure processor and therefore forced yourself into a more restricted contractual role that would in fact prevent you from using the data to do you know, broader, uh, to use it for your broader business purposes, including to entrain and improve your models. So that's why this becomes a really important thing to think through up front. Conversely, if you've um, sort of gone and, and up front decided that you are a controller of the data, then that is can create some commercial sensitivity if you're going to market as a controller because often you know if you're dealing with customers they're pretty familiar with dealing with a processor they may have a standard data processing agreement data processing agreement that they're ready to roll out and use with you as a vendor or they may be willing to accept your dpa um, and you know they kind of understand the process for dealing with a processor but if they're now having to deal with you as a controller that can often spark some commercial sensitivity, largely because there's some misunderstanding about how to paper for that. And also it means that there's going to be more compliance considerations that the customer, if you're the vendor, is going to have to think through. They're now going to have to establish legal grounds to be able to share the data with you to use it uh, for controller purposes. So very um, careful positioning, uh, you know, needs, it needs to be thought about and carefully positioned in your contractual documentation. Uh, because if, for example, you, you, you say you're a processor, you have to stick in that lane and you could be contractually boxed in and you wouldn't be able to use it for broader purposes. Um, conversely, if you're willing to go to market as a controller, you need to have a very good privacy story to explain, um, you know, why you're a controller, how you're going to protect the data and get your customers comfortable with that. So moving on to the next slide, please, Richard. So how do you identify then whether you're a controller or processor? So before we dig into this, I think it's worth taking a quick step back and considering the different phases involved in the development of AI. So there's usually an initial data preparation stage where the data is being gathered and prepared. Um, and then that data would then be effectively used to train um, to train the AI algorithms using that data. And through that training uh, process, it's then kind of used to generate a model. And when we talk about data models, we're really talking about mathematical algorithms that have been that are uh, trained using data, and then usually a human expert would input into that uh, to enable that model to identify patterns and connections between the different data points. And importantly, that data model is then applied to a particular use case. And at this point, we're in the deployment phase. So then it may be used um, for the purposes that that AI technology was designed for. So usually in order to provide predictions or classifications to, ass to assist with human decision making or to, to make an automated decision itself. So the development of those models is really crucial. So what sort of decisions can you make in those different phases um, as a controller? Now, bear in mind, we talked about this a little bit earlier. Remember, a, a controller is the entity that decides how and why data is processed. A processor cannot do that. It can only act on the instructions of the controller. So the types of decisions that would typically be made by a controller include things like the target output for the models, the feature selection, the source and nature of the training data. They would also typically decide on the kinds of um, machine, learning, machine learning algorithms that would be used to create the models. Also sort of key model pro, uh, parameters such as you know, how complex a decision tree can be or how many models will be included. They would also make key decisions over the evaluation metrics and loss functions. So, you know, how do you trade off between false positives and false negatives? 
Um, and equally, a controller would usually be determining the process for testing and updating the models. So how often is that testing happening? What kinds of data need to be used for that? Um, and how ongoing performance will be assessed? So they are the key decision makers here with respect to the personal data that will be used. And we'll go through the different phases that I just talked about in a second and sort of apply that in context. Conversely, as I mentioned, the processor has a much more uh, limited ability to decide on any, um, you know, key um, decisions over how and why that data is processed. But they do have the ability to make certain decisions. So typically, a, a, a processor would be able to decide on what types of security measures would be used to protect the data. Um, they could also make decisions about what types of IT systems and methods would be used to process the data, so the technical means of processing. Um, so in the context of AI, that might include the specific implementation of the generic um, algorithms that are used. So what kind of programming language and code li libraries might be used? Um, they may also be able to make decisions over how the data and models are stored or how, how they could retrieve, transfer, or delete, or dispose of that data. But importantly, and I always raise this, a processor should never be making decisions over how long they retain the data for. Because remember, again, they should only be retaining it under the instructions of the controller. So it's really the controller who should be deciding how long that data is retained for, and the processor has to delete it when asked by the controller. Um, but a processor could take decisions over, you know, how to optimize the measures used to optimize the learning algorithms, the type of computing resources that might be able to be used. Also, the architectural details of how models will be deployed. So, you know, what choice of virtual machines or microservices and APIs. That, those are all decisions that could be made by the processor. And just so you're aware, this is all kind of uh, examples that are provided in the ICO AI auditing framework. So the UK regulator, as Richard has um, briefly mentioned before, has produced some really helpful guidance. Um, and these are all examples of the types of decisions referenced in that guidance, which I think is a helpful one to go back to, to kind of think about, hang on a second, with this particular processing activity, who's really making the decisions here about how and why data is processed? Next slide, please, Richard. So sort of taking those principles, let's think of some real life examples. So as I mentioned, there would typically be a sort of developmental training phase, which is where the data that you've collected and prepared is being used to create a model by identifying different patterns and connections between the different data points. And at that point, typically, the AI vendor would be processing data as a controller because they're clearly determining and making key decisions over what data is, is required uh, to be used to train that model and how it will and how the processing will happen. So for the development and training of AI models, it will almost certainly be the case that the vendor or the, the entity that's using the data for that purposes would be a controller something to really bear in mind when you're thinking about, hang on a second, if I'm a vendor that's, that's collecting data from my customer, am I actually, uh, am I gonna need to be able to use that or do I want to be able to use that to train my models later down the line? And if you think you might want to leverage that data for your broader training and development purposes, then that should trigger a question, hang on a second, am I acting as a controller for that purpose? And do I need to make sure that I've carved out the necessary rights and permissions in the customer contract to be able to do that? So something to bear in mind there. Another typical example would be where AI is being provided as a, you know, AI prediction as a service. So the technology is being deployed as a service. Um, and to break down that kind of example, so this would be a scenario in which the AI vendor develops its own models and then allows the customer to send queries to them via, for example, an API. Um, and then that then they would get responses back from the model. So, for example, if the customer is using uh, the model to understand, you know, what um, objects are in a particular image. So in the context of, for example, a self-driving car, um, if there's a load of images being collected uh, by the camera on the car, then this model then may be used to review those images and produce certain outputs like to classify the objects in the image. And at that point, um, typically, 
the service provider here, the vendor, would be um, acting as a processor to the extent that the data that is being deployed through the model for that purpose is really being used to make predictions and classifications on behalf of the customer. Uh, and that would assume that the vendor is never doing anything else with the data, it's just being replayed through the models to produce the outputs. However, as I mentioned above, if that vendor then wants to use that data to create and improve its models at that point, then we would be looking at a controller role. So again, you could be using wearing two hats there, um, depending on what you're wanting to do with the data. Um, and then interestingly, the ICO guidance on this has also indicated that if, for example, that vendor was actually pretty crucially involved in or had an influence over how and why those predictions were being made or the development of the model that was being used specifically to provide that service to the customer, then there may actually be some element of joint controllership that arises there. I think that would be relatively rare, but it's just something to keep in mind. Um, that if you're starting as a vendor to have more influence over the essential elements of how and why the processing is happening to make the those predictions and classifications with the customer, then there could be some element of joint controllership there. Um, and then let's look at another model. Um, so uh, another typical scenario would be that a vendor is leveraging customer data to create a customized model for the customer's sole use. So this would be the customer provides a whole load of data and they want the vendor to create a specific model to deal with a uh, specific issue. Um, or a, a particular use case. Um, and at that point, assuming again that the uh, vendor is really only ever using the data on the instructions of the customer, then we would usually say that that would be a processor role. Um, but again, always got to be careful that there's no other wider use of the data to do things like training and development of the AI model, because then we would be looking also at a controller hat. Um, the final model is one in which the AI vendor provides tools for, say, machine learning that enable the customer to build and run their own models. Um, and the customer would be choosing the data and really just using the tool and the infrastructure provided by the vendor to, um, you know, develop their own AI uh, technology. And at that point, I think we're looking at more of a processor role there. Now, this is just, you know, just some examples. These aren't definitive conclusions. Again, it's always going to depend on the particular context. Um, but I think, that, you know, there, it's very likely that in most scenarios, people could be wearing multiple hats depending on what they're trying to do with the data. And I think another common example is we see the development of things like global models. And I, when I say global models, I mean data models that a vendor may be wanting to use across its customer base. And they may have almost like a give to get model whereby they ask the customer and kind of say, look, we need your data to train this global model so that our customers get the benefit of the predictions and the insights. And that relies on every customer providing us with their uh, with their data to enable us to train and develop that model, which then you get the benefit of um, and use to get certain outputs. And typically in that scenario, um, you know, the, the, there would be more of a controller role by the vendor, but it would very much depend on how that role was constructed in the contracts. And in some cases, we've seen vendors trying to position themselves as a processor in that role and making it work. But um, yeah, it's a tricky one to balance there because you would effectively be having to get instructions from each and every customer to build that global model. And that, it's not always an easy fit uh, with a processor role and also boxes you in, in terms terms of how and, and why you can use the data because you always have to constantly going back to the uh, multiple customers that you have or will be the controllers. So it's a more natural fit in that sort of global model scenario to say that you are a controller of all the data that's being deployed and used to train the model and to produce the outputs. So um, it's you know not always clear cut. Um, and it, there needs to be very careful consideration for exactly, you know, how you're using the data, how long you want to retain it for, um, what the contracts that you have in place with your customers say, um, before you kind of assume that you can automatically, say, use data for your broader purposes. Um, 
that has taken us perfectly to the top of the hour. We promised that we would try and keep these webinar series sort of focused and, and, 30, and 30 minutes long, and I think we've achieved that today, which I'm pleased about. Um, just a kind of final wrap up to say the slides will be available on the Phil Fisher Silicon Valley YouTube channel. Um, so if you want to go and listen to this again, uh, you'll be able to find the slides and the full recording on our YouTube channel. Also, Richard and I are actually doing the next webinar series um, or the next in this series where we'll be breaking down the obligations that apply to you when, you when you're a controller. So if you are a controller of the personal data, what do you actually need to be doing to comply with the GDPR? Um, so we'll be having a little bit more of a focused discussion about that aspect. And that's going to be taking place on April the 14th. So we'll be sending around an invite. Usually we post it on LinkedIn. So keep an eye out for that. Um, also, if you have any questions, we don't usually have too many time for questions on these webinars, but we'd love to hear from you. So feel free to email Richard or I. Our details are on the slide deck. Um, if you have any questions, please do reach out. And uh, yeah, watch out. More to come on this webinar series um, on AI.